many times you may come across the uh, patients who complains that there is lack of hearing from them side now it is because of the hearing loss now to find out uh, what is the type of deafness and uh, what is the degree of hearing loss we have to uh, do some kind of test these are known as hearing test not only this these hearing tests are also important to find out which type of hearing aid is required and what configuration is required in the hearing aid all this is done based on the hearing test so today in this practical we'll discuss about the eighth cranial nerve examination which includes the hearing test so without wasting time let's get started Today's practical is on 8th cranial nerve examination. 8th cranial nerve is also known as vestibular cochlear nerve. It mainly revolves around the hearing test. So uh, I am Dr. Gitesh Duval. Let's see in today's practical what we are going to study. So in today's practical, first we will discuss about the theory of vestibular cochlear nerve. In that, we will discuss about the vestibular division and the cochlear division. Then we will discuss about the instruments which are used in today's practical. Mainly it is the tuning forks, the analog watch and Galton whistle. Then we will discuss how to use the instrument, particularly the tuning fork. So here we will discuss about the correct method of using the tuning fork. Then we will discuss about the which are the hearing test, mainly the tuning fork test, then watch tick test and voice test. And lastly we will discuss about the question answers which are, which are given in the journal. So this is all we will discuss in today's practical. So vestibular cochlear now, the name consists of two names, vestibular portion that is vestibular division and cochlear portion that is cochlear division. Now before we dive into the vestibular and cochlear division, let us first understand the anatomy of the ear. Now this is the pinna or the outer side of the ear and this is known as external ear up to eardrum. So this portion including the pinna is known as external ear. Now inside the eardrum this portion is known as the middle ear and this portion is known as the inner ear. So there are three portion of the ear, external ear, middle ear and internal ear. In the internal ear you can see this is a circular ring like structure this is known as cochlea. This cochlear portion is for the hearing that is how we hear the sounds. This portion is known as vestibule. It contains secule and utricle and these are the semicircular canals. This vestibule and semicircular canal together is known as vestibular apparatus and that constitutes the vestibular division and it mainly concerned with the equilibrium of the body. So vestibular cochlear now composed of two important functions. One is equilibrium that is carried out by the vestibular nerve and another is the hearing portion that is carried out by the cochlear nerve. Now we will discuss about the vestibular test. These vestibular tests are only for the demonstration. Remember that this test need not be performed by you in examination. Okay. So with that keep in mind, let's start with the principle. In this all this test, what is the principle is that we stimulate the semicircular canal, secule and utricle. We stimulate by various means. Ultimately, we have to find out the nystagmus. So whenever we stimulate the vestibular apparatus, the result is nystagmus. Now what is nystagmus? It is the involuntary to and fro movement of the eyeball. Okay, it is something similar to the tremor. Like tremor of hands, there is a tremor of the eyeball. So that is what we will look into after stimulating the vestibular apparatus. In that what we will look, we will look for the rate of nystagmus means how frequency is the of the nystagmus that is in which speed the oscillation is happening then direction of the nystagmus. There are two components of nystagmus fast nystagmus and slow nystagmus. The fast component of the nystagmus is the direction of the nystagmus. So uh, initially it will move slowly then it will move fast slowly then fast. So the direction of the fast nystagmus is the direction of the nystagmus and the amplitude that is the rate or the amplitude or the intensity at which the movement is happening. So at what level the movement is happening. So rate that is frequency direction that is the direction of the fast portion and amplitude that is the amplitude or the intensity of the nystagmus. So these three things will keep in mind when carrying out the various tests. So which are the tests? 
First is Bereni rotating chair test. As you can see in this diagram, the person is made to sit on a chair. At the base of the chair, there is one motor. So this motor can spin the chair at a particular speed. So here the person is made to rotate on a rotating chair. And after that, the person is made to sit stand still. What will happen? There will be development of nystagmus in the person's eye. It is because of the mechanical stimulation of the vestibular apparatus. Then second test is known as caloric test. In caloric test, what we give? We give thermal stimulation of the vestibular apparatus. So here we pour cold or hot saline into the ear of external ear of the patient. So when we pour cold or hot saline, there will be development of nystagmus in the patient's eye. Now, what kind of nystagmus will happen? It will depend upon whether it is a cold saline or hot saline. For remembering that, there is one mnemonic that is known as COWS. C stands for cold saline. So when cold saline is poured into the ear, opposite side nystagmus happens. So suppose the cold saline was poured on the right ear, then the nystagmus direction, the fast component will be on the left side. Okay. Now when warm saline is poured into the ear, the direction of the nystagmus will be on the same side. So if the warm saline was poured into the right ear, the nystagmus will also will be on the right side. So this is the caloric test. Here we give thermal stimulation to the vestibular apparatus. The third test is known as galvanic nystagmus. In galvanic nystagmus, we give electrical stimulation to the vestibular apparatus. So electrodes are placed inside the ear and we give electrical stimulation to the vestibular apparatus and the result will be again the nystagmus. So here the nystagmus is the rate direction amplitude is seen based on the strength of the current. So these are the three tests which are used for testing the vestibular apparatus of the person. Again, I will repeat, it is just a demonstration and need not be performed in examination. Okay, now we'll discuss about the cochlear division. Before we go into cochlear division, we'll discuss about the sound physics. So first of all, what is the definition of sound? If you recollect from physics, any particle that vibrates will produce a sound. So sound is nothing but it is a vibration of the particles. Then what is the unit of intensity of sound? The unit of intensity of sound is decibel, where D is small and B is capital. What is the unit of frequency of sound? It is hertz, that is waves per second. What is the speed of sound? The speed of sound is 330 meter per second in air at 20 degrees Celsius. Okay. What is the hearing range? The hearing range is 20 to 20,000 Hertz, but maximum sensitivity of human ear is between 1000 to 3000 Hertz. And last, what are the receptors of sound waves? The receptors of sound waves are present in the inner ear, in the cochlea, and they are the hair cells in organ of corti. These are all viva questions when hearing test practical is conducted in examination. These are some of the viva questions regarding the sound physics. Now, some of the more viva questions are which are the sound intensities. So, whispering, when you whisper, the sound intensity is between 20 to 30 decibels. When we are doing normal conversation, like now, it is usually around 60 decibel. In heavy traffic, it is 80 decibel. When a loud horn is being played, it is 100 decibel. At 120 decibel, you can uh, feel any sound as a noise and you will feel discomfort. More than 140 decibel is the jet engine sound and it can damage the cochlea. If you see, the decibels are very close, but actually they are very far away because decibel is the logarithm of the intensity of sound. So basically, even though the numbers are looking very close, they are uh, even one decibel increase will be tenfold increase in the sound intensity. That is the range of the sound intensity. So this is about the sound physics. Now let's move to the next slide. Okay, now we'll discuss about the sound transmission in the cochlear division. This is very important concept for all the hearing tests. So please hear this carefully. There are two types of air condu uh, sound conduction. One is air conduction. Second is bone conduction. Now air conduction, name is suggest. Here the sound is transmitted through the air from the external pinna. It goes into the external auditory meatus through the ear canal. It will, the sound will hit the eardrum. So eardrum will vibrate. Then that will cause the move, uh, movement of the ossicles. Ossicle will amplify the sound and this will cause movement of the stapes which is attached to the cochlea. So it will change the fluid movement inside the cochlea and that is how we hear the sound. So this is the normal air conduction pathway. The sound is transmitted through the air. Another is bone conduction. Name itself suggests here the sound hits the skull bone. 
and this skull bone will set up the vibrations and these vibrations are immediately given to the cochlea so bone conduction so bone conduction is an abnormal pathway of conduction air conduction is the normal pathway of conduction so remember air conduction is normal bone conduction is abnormal the third conduction that is shown here is the cartilage conduction so sound is transmitted through the cartilage but it plays very minute role and not at all important in today's practical so only remember two conduction air conduction and bone conduction now there is another important viva question here that is tympanic reflex another name of tympanic reflex is acoustic reflex now how this reflex is initiated it is only initiated when the person is exposed to the loud sound like a loud sound produced by bursting of a cracker at the time of diwali so this tympanic reflex is produced now what happens two muscles are involved here two muscles are present in the middle here the name of these two muscles is tensor tympani and stapedius tensor tympani is attached to the handle of the malleus okay and stapedius is attached to the uh, the stapes foot plate so whenever the tensor tympani muscle contracts it will pull the malleus inside okay and uh, whenever the stapedius contracts it will push the stapes outside so because of the opposite movement of these two muscles the ossicular chain will become rigid so whenever the person is exposed to very loud sound these two muscles will contract simultaneously and it will make this ossicular chain absolutely rigid so that is why the sound is not been transmitted through the ossicular chain to the cochlea and that is how the cochlea has been prevented from getting damaged because of very loud sound this is known as tympanic reflex okay now another important topic is deafness okay now there is one terminology known as hearing impairment so what is hearing impairment what is deafness technically speaking hearing impairment means there is a some loss of hearing but not complete loss so whenever there is not complete loss of hearing but some loss of hearing then the term hearing impairment should be used and what is deafness deafness means complete loss of hearing but most of the scientists and most of the medical community don't use hearing impairment as a word they in general use the word deafness but there is some technical difference between hearing impairment and deafness if the examiner ask okay but in general we'll use the word deafness because it is very common in the medical community so what are the types of deafness there are three types of deafness conductive deafness sensory neural deafness and mixed deafness now conductive deafness conductive deafness means there is a problem in the air conduction if you recollect from the previous slide air conduction happens in the external ear and it happens in the middle ear so any problem in the external ear or middle ear will result into the conductive deafness so what can be the problem for example in the external ear if there is a wax or foreign body in the external ear then it will impede the movement of the sound waves so if there is a some body foreign body inside the external ear it will not allow the sound transmission and that will result into lack of hearing or there may be thickening of the tympanic membrane because of any reason or if there is a rupture of tympanic membrane because of the trauma to the ear and there is a rupture of tympanic membrane then also conductive deafness will happen in the middle ear what will happen this ossicular chain become very thick or calcified this is known as otosclerosis there is one disease known as otosclerosis in this the bones the ossicular ossicle bones becomes very calcified and they lack the movement because of lack of movement there is no sound transmission properly and the third is uh, another reason is normally this middle ear is filled with air because of the connection with the eustachian tube but if there is an infection of the middle ear it will be filled with the fluid the term is known as otitis media so otitis media otitis means inflammation and media means the middle ear so whenever there is an inf inflam infection of the middle ear the fluid will be filled in the middle ear and that will uh, result into lack of sound transmission another reason may be blockage of eustachian tube this eustachian tube is connected to the nose so nose is connected to the middle ear through the eustachian tube now in whenever the person is having common cold this eustachian tube gets blocked because of that the air inside the middle ear slowly gets absorbed and it will result into partial vacuum and that will pull the uh, eardrum inside and this eardrum will become very tense and that will result into lack of movement and that can also result into conductive deafness so in short conductive deafness is present whenever there is some problem in the external ear or there is problem in the middle ear sensory neural deafness name itself suggests sensory neural so there is problem in the sensory organ or there is a problem in the neural pathway if there is a damage to the cochlea 
because of hereditary causes or because of trauma tumor or infection then it can result into the sensory neural deafness it may be because of the factory noise too much long exposure of factory noise can damage the cochlea and that can also result into sensory neural deafness if there is a same way trauma tumor or infection of the auditory nerve or the in auditory pathway then also it will result into sensory neural deafness so sensory neural means there is damage to the cochlea or the auditory pathway okay and mix means both of them are there present that is conductive deafness is also there and there is sensory neural deafness is also there that is known as mixed deafness so these are the types of deafness which will be asked in examination so these are the causes of deafness okay now another uh, viva question is what is the who classification of deafness so deafness has been divided into various categories ba based on the degree of hearing loss so what is that here you can see whenever there is a hearing loss of 26 to 40 decibel it is known as mild deafness whenever the hearing loss is of 41 to 60 decibel it is known as moderate deafness whenever the hearing loss is of 61 to 80 decibel it is known as severe deafness and whenever the deafness is more than 81 decibel the person usually does not able to hear normal conversation also this is known as profound deafness so these are the four categories of deafness degree of deafness by who mild moderate severe and profound okay now what are the instruments which are used in hearing test so first is tuning fork this is the most important instrument now as you can see these are the tuning forks now what are the parts of tuning fork these are known as forks okay this portion is the fork portion this is the stem portion and this is the base portion okay now in the stem portion if you see in each tuning fork there is some uh, dilated portion in the center of the stem this is the portion where we have to hold the tuning fork so this dilation is for the holding of the tuning fork okay now you can see there are various sizes of tuning fork these are of various different frequencies of tuning fork the smaller one is 512 hertz the middle one is the 256 hertz tuning fork and the bigger one is 128 hertz tuning fork so as you can see the smaller the frequency the larger the tuning fork but need not you should not uh, mug these values because these values are already written in the stem portion of the tuning fork so if examiner asks what is the frequency of this tuning fork you can look at the stem portion usually the number is written what is the frequency of the tuning fork okay now this is the galton whistle here this portion this portion is the where the person blows air and whistling is produced and this is the screw of the whistle so when you tight the screw or loosen the screw we can change the frequency of the whistle and it is based on the millimeters distance okay this is galton's whistle this is the stopwatch it is a sticking stopwatch which is used for watch tick test and this is the audiometer used for pure tone audiometry but remember the galton whistle and audiometer are only for demonstration they need not be done in examination on in examination you have to do only the tuning fork and watch tick test okay how to use the tuning fork let's see step by step first hold the stem portion with the thumb and index finger only so you should only use your thumb and index finger for holding the tuning fork if you use multiple hands the vibration will get dampened and you will not be able to induce the vibrations for longer period of time so only hold the stem with index and thumb finger okay then hit the distal portion this is the distal portion of the fork hit the distal portion of the tuning fork on the rubber pad that is provided or you can use your hypothenar eminence of your hand okay so you have to use only these two portion need not hit the distal end at any basin or any uh, granite portion otherwise it will break the tuning fork so only use the rubber pad or hypothenar eminence for setting up the vibrations then place the base of the tuning fork on the bony prominence of the patient so this is the base of the tuning fork place this base on the bony prominence of the patient only it will be effective only on the bony prominences now what is the pro tip here lower the frequency of the tuning fork more will be the vibrations okay so 128 hertz tuning fork will produce more vibrations higher the frequency of the tuning fork more will be the sound okay so if you use 512 hertz tuning fork it will produce more sound but the vibration will be less so it is reverse inverse in relationship okay now let us look at the video or how to use the tuning fork
so this is a tuning fork this is how you have to hold from the dilated portion of the stem with the thumb and index finger this is a rubber pad hit the tuning fork at the distal portion okay so hit like this and place the base of the tuning fork on the bony prominence of the patient so this is how it has been used okay now which are the hearing test which need to be performed in examination so first is rainis test Second is Weber's test. Third is Squibex test. All these three tests are known as tuning fork test because in all these three tests we use the tuning fork. Again, I will repeat: Rennie's test, Weber's test, and Squibex test. All these three tests are tuning fork tests. Then fourth is voice test, and fifth is watch tick test. Only these tests you need to be performing in examination. Rest all the tests are only for demonstration. Okay. So what is the principle of all the tuning fork test? The principle is very simple. If you remember the air conduction and bone conduction, normal ear, the air conduction is always better. So in a healthy ear, the sound will always pass through the pinna, external auditory meatus, ear canal, ear drum, middle ear, and then cochlea. So it will always pass through the air. So air conduction is always better in healthy ear. Okay. Second principle is. bone conduction is better in conductive deafness what happens in conductive deafness there is problem in the external ear or middle ear so that is the reason why air conduction is not proper because of the problem in the external ear or middle ear air conduction is not proper so what is the another alternative for the body another alternative is bone conduction that is why bone conduction is better in conductive deafness it is because of masking masking of air conduction results into better bone conduction so in conductive deafness bone conduction will be always better than air conduction in sensory neural deafness in sensory neural deafness there is problem in the cochlea and auditory pathway so because of that both air conduction and bone conduction both will be poor but still somewhat air conduction will be better than the bone conduction so you have to remember in sensory neural deafness both ac and bc are poor that is air conduction and bone conduction both are poor but still air conduction is better compared to the bone conduction so this is the principle you have to keep in mind in all the test if you remember this principle you will be able to interpret the results very easily again i'll repeat the galton whistle test need not to be done in examination it is just for demonstration only okay first rainis test what are the steps first instruct the subject about the procedure this is very important otherwise the person will not cooperate in the test so instruct everything what you are going to do on the subject second hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad as i mentioned how to hold the tuning fork and how to hit and set up the vibrations on the tuning fork third step you have to place the base of the stump The, you have to place the base of the tuning fork on the mastoid process the mastoid process is the bony process behind the ear so behind the ear if you feel you can feel the bony prominence that is known as mastoid process you have to place the base of the tuning fork on the mastoid process and ask the person to raise the hand when he stops hearing what is happening here is the bone conduction because we are send, sending the vibrations through the mastoid process to the cochlea so here bone conduction is happening and we have to ask the person when he stops hearing the sound so when he stops hearing sound he has to raise his hand then what we have to do as soon as he uh, raises his hand we have to place the tips of the tuning fork near the ear of the patient the distal end the distal end of the tuning fork is to be placed near the ear of the hand uh, ear of the patient and you have to ask the person whether he is able to still hear the sound if he is able to still hear the sound that means air conduction is there what is happening here here the vibrations are being transmitted through the air into the tympanic membrane so this is the air conduction so this is air conduction this is bone conduction okay so first we are doing bone conduction when person stops hearing the bone conduction we do air conduction when we ask the patient whether he is still able to hear the sound so what are your observation so first if air conduction is better than bone conduction means the person is still able to hear the sound in the second stage that means air conduction is better than bone conduction then the test is positive if the person says no i am not able to hear the sound that means the bone conduction was better than air conduction so when bone conduction is better than air conduction the rainis test is negative third condition may be the person is not able to hear at any stage whether you place on the mastoid process or we you place the tuning fork near the ear the person is not able to hear anywhere that is no sound is heard so these are the three possibilities in this test 
Now, what is your inference? The result is when the air conduction is better than bone conduction, that is when the Rennes test is positive, the person is having normal hearing. Okay. So, in as I said, in normal person, the air conduction is always better. So, whenever the air conduction is better, the person is having normal hearing. Whenever the bone conduction is better, that means the person is having conductive deafness. So, whenever the bone conduction is greater than air conduction, that means the person is having conductive deafness. In sensory neural deafness, in majority of the cases, when it is severe, the person is not able to hear any sound at any stage. So, person is not hearing any sound at any stage, that means the person is having sensory neural deafness. But in some cases where there is partial sensory neural deafness, the air conduction can be better than bone conduction. So, these are the three scenarios of normal hearing, conductive deafness and sensory neural deafness in the Rennes test. Okay, now let's look at the video of Rennes test, how it is done. So, as you can see, this is how you have to hold. First, you have to give instruction to the subject. Then, you have to hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad and place the base at the mastoid process and ask the patient to raise his hand. As soon as he raises his hand, put it near the ear of the patient. So, this is how it is done. Okay, now Weber's test. What are the steps? First, again, same. Instruct the subject about the procedure. Tell him what you are going to do. Second, hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad. Set up the vibrations on the tuning fork. And third, place the base of the tuning fork on the center of the forehead like this. Okay. And then ask the subject whether he is able to hear the sound better on particular any ear or not. That is lateralization. And whether he is able to hear sounds equally on both the sides. So, this is lateralization or equal. So, what are your observation? The person may say it is better heard in the deaf ear. That is the person will be uh, saying that I am able to hear better in the ear in which he is complaining. So, suppose the person ha had a complaint that my right ear I am not able to hear. But in this Weber's test, he is better hearing in the right ear. That means there is uh, better heard in the deaf ear. Then better heard in the healthy ear. If the com patient uh, com uh, says that he is able to uh, hear the sound better in the healthy ear. Okay, so this is second scenario and third scenario is when the person is able to hear the sound equally in both the ears. So, these are the only three scenarios possible in this test. Better heard in the deaf ear, better heard in the healthy ear or equal on the both sides. Now, let us look at the result. When the person is having a normal hearing, the result will be equal on both sides. So, the patient will say that he is able to hear the sound equally on both the sides. There is no lateralization. Okay. In conductive deafness, what will happen? The person will complain that he is better hearing in the deaf ear. That means he is better hearing in the ear in which he is having complaint. Okay. In conductive deafness. In sensorineural deafness, the person will complain that he is better hearing in the healthy ear. So, in sensorineural deafness, as I said, air conduction, both bone conduction, both are defective. So, person will be better hearing in the healthy ear. So, in sensorineural deafness, it is better heard in the healthy ear. Now, remember in the Weber's test, one, there is one big limitation. If the person is having deafness in both the ears, that is meant there is a bilateral defect is present in both the ears. The Weber's test is not effective. It is only effective when there is unilateral deafness. That means when the deafness is only limited to one ear, then Weber test is effective. Otherwise, in bilateral diseases, it is not effective. Now, let us look at the video of how Weber test is done. So, here also, first give instruction to the subject what you are going to do. Then, hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad and place the base of the tuning fork on the center of the forehead and the patient will say whether he is able to hear equally on both the sides or not. So, this is how the test is done. Okay, now Squebeck's test. What are the steps? First, instruct the subject as usual. Tell the whole procedure what you are going to do on the subject. Then, hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad and set up the vibrations. Then, place the base of the tuning fork. Base of the tuning fork on the mastoid process of the subject. Okay, place it on the mastoid process of the subject and instruct him that he has to raise his hand when he stops hearing. So, as soon as the person stops hearing, he has to raise his hand. Okay, then fourth step, as soon as he raises his hand, place the base of the tuning fork on your mastoid process, 
on the same year in which it is tested so place the base of the tuning fork on the master press of the examiner and you have to look whether you can still hear the sound or not okay so this is what is quebec test about if you see what we are doing here is we are con comparing the bone conduction of the patient with the bone conduction of the examiner considering the examiner is normal okay we consider examiner is having normal hearing and we are comparing the bone conduction of the subject to the uh, bone conduction of the examiner so what are your observation there are only three scenarios possible the bone conduction of examiner the bone conduction of examiner can be better than the bone conduction of the subject or the bone conduction of the subject can be better than the bone conduction of the examiner or the bone conduction of both of them are equal so these are the only three scenarios possible so what is the result when the person is having normal hearing bone conduction of the subject and the examiner will be equal so in normal hearing both will have equal bone conduction okay in conductive deafness what will happen the bone conduction of the subject will be better than the examiner why this happens because the subject is having lack of air conduction so bone conduction is better in this subject while the bone conduction is not better in the normal person because air conduction is there so here the bone conduction of the subject will be better than the examiner when that happens it is conductive deafness in sensory neural deafness the bone conduction of the examiner will be better than the subject here also because in sensory neural deafness air conduction bone conduction both does not happen so because of that the bone conduction of the examiner will be better so here the bone conduction of the examiner will be better than the subject so these are the three results of the squabex test now let us look at the video how the squabex test is done so here again you have to give instruction to the subject what you are going to do then hit the tuning fork and place the base of the tuning fork on the master press of the subject and ask the person to raise his hand so he raises his hand and immediately put the base on your master press and you have to look whether you are still here able to hear or not if you are not able to hear the person is having normal hearing okay now we'll do the voice test what are the steps first thing you have to instruct the subject the whole procedure now this test is particularly carried out in silent room so silence is very important to carry out this test second at sufficient distance you have to whisper the word 1 2 3 so you have to ask the subject to uh, close one ear then you have to stand a little bit away from the subject and then you have to whisper the words 1 2 3 and you have to ask the subject what is able to hear if he is not able to identify then come closer and closer at one particular distance he will be able to identify what you are saying that you have to measure so you have to measure the distance at which the person is able to identify the words 1 2 3 then you have to repeat this procedure now you becoming the subject and the subject becomes the examiner and the examiner will say some words and then you have to identify what he is saying at a particular distance now measure this distance now you have to compare the distance of the examiner with the distance of the subject so what are your observation there can be only two observation one is the distance of both subject and examiner are equal so subject and examiner the distance of both of them are equal one scenario another scenario is the distance of the subject is less than that of the examiner that means the person has to come very close for the person to hear so the subject the distance of subject is less than examiner why only two scenario because we are considering the examiner as normal that is why only two scenario what can be the result the result is when the normal hearing is there the distance of both of them are equal so when the distance of both of the examiner and the subject are equal that means the person is having normal hearing deafness when deafness is there the distance of the subject is less than examiner so the distance at which the person is able to identify is very less compared to that of the subject that means the person has to come very close to identify that means the person is having deafness so whenever the deafness is there the distance is less of the subject compared to the examiner now here you can see we can only say whether the person is deaf or not we cannot know the type of deafness whether it is conductive or sensory neural so that is the weakness of voice test we cannot know the type of deafness we can only know whether the person is deaf or not now next is voice trick test what are the steps first again instruct the subject about the procedure here also the silent room is very essential for hearing of the ticking of the watch then start the stopwatch you have to start the stopwatch and the ask the subject to close one ear so you have to test each ear separately then bring the stopwatch closer and closer to the ear of the subject 
and you have to bring till the subject hears the sound when the ticking of the watch is heard by the subject you have to stop and you have to measure the distance and you have to repeat the same procedure with the examiner so when you do on the subject then the examiner becomes the subject and subject becomes examiner and repeat the same procedure so here also again we are comparing the distance of the subject with the distance of the examiner so this is how watch tick test is done so what are your observ observation so distance of the subject and examiner can be equal so distance of the examiner and the distance of the subject both are equal second distance of the subject is less than examiner the distance of the subject is less than the distance of the examiner so only these two scenario is there the reason is because we consider the examiner as having normal hearing now there are two result when the person is having normal hearing when the subject is having normal hearing the distance of the subject and examiner both are equal when the person is having deafness that means the distance of the subject will be less than the distance of the examiner that means the examiner should bring the stopwatch very close to the ear for the subject to hear it so when the distance of the subject is less than that of the examiner the person is having deafness again here we cannot know the type of deafness so that is about the watch tick test okay now let's revise and see all the three important tuning fork test again look at the video and identify how it is to be doing starting with the rennes test So in Rennes test, first instruct the subject what is the procedure you are going to do. Hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad, place the base of the tuning fork on the mastered process of the subject, ask the subject to raise his hand, immediately bring the tuning fork near the ear. Now looking to the Weber's test. In the Weber's test, give the instruction to the subject what you are going to do. Then hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad. Place the base of the tuning fork on the center of the forehead. Ask the subject whether he is able to hear equally on both sides or not. Then Squebex test. In Squebex test, again give instructions to the subject what you are going to do. Hit the tuning fork on the rubber pad. Place the base of the tuning fork on mastered process of the subject. Ask the person to raise his hand when he stops hearing. Immediately put the base of the tuning fork on your master process and see whether you are also stop hearing or not. So this is a short video of all the three important tests. So this is the observation table of all the tests. This observation table is very important because in this observation table you can know various situations in normal hearing, in conductive deafness and sensory neural deafness. So try to understand and remember this observation table that will help you in examination. Starting with the Rennes test, in Rennes test in normal hearing, the air conduction will be better than bone conduction because normally air conduction is always better. In conductive deafness, the bone conduction will be better than the air conduction. In sensory neural deafness, if the person is having a severe sensory neural deafness, the person will say that he has not heard at any stage of the test. So if the person is not able to hear sound at any stage, that means sensory neural deafness. If there is a partial sensory neural deafness, the person will say that air conduction was better than bone conduction. Now second test, Weber's test. In Weber's test, in normal hearing, the person will say that he is able to hear the sound equally in both the ears. That means there is no lateralization. In conductive deafness, the person will say that he is able to hear better in the deaf ear. That means lateralization to the deaf ear. In sensory neural deafness, the subject will say that he is able to hear better in the healthy ear. So in sensory neural deafness, the lateralization is to the healthy ear. Third test, Squebex test. In Squebex test, in normal hearing, the bone conduction of both examiner and subject will be equal. While in case of conductive deafness, the bone conduction will be better in the subject compared to the examiner. In sensory neural deafness, the bone conduction will be worst in the subject compared to the examiner. Now fourth is voice test. In voice test, in normal hearing, the distance of the subject and examiner will be equal. Okay. In conductive deafness, the distance of the subject will be less compared to the distance of the examiner. In sensory deafness, again the distance will be less because we have to bring the face of the patient or we have to bring our voice very close to the subject. So distance is less in the subject. Watch tick test, similar principle. Normal hearing, the distance is equal in both. In conductive deafness, the distance is less in subject. In sensory neural deafness, the distance is again less in subject. And last Galton's whistle test, this test need not be done in examination. So you have to write not done, not done and not done. 
so this is about the observation table try to remember this table if you remember this table you will be able to do this test in examination also very easily okay now we will come to another test that is audiometry now this test is not to be done in examination but it is important for vivas so audiometry also known as pure tone audiometry or pta now this is the audiometer this will produce various sounds and these sounds are transmitted through the headphone to the subject now there are various configuration buttons available where we can change the frequency and intensity of sound and then we do the test so again i will repeat it is only for demonstration this need not be done in examination now for this test for PTA you should have absolutely silent room so soundproof room is absolutely essential in audiometry without that you cannot do audiometry now here the headphones are given to the subject and subject wears the headphones on the head and then a white noise is produced in one ear and another ear the various sounds are produced that, that is the testing ear so testing ear will various sounds are produced of different frequency and intensity we will start with the low level and then we will go to the high level and then we instruct the subject that he has to raise his hand whenever he hears the sound and that is recorded on the paper that is known as audiogram so how the audiogram looks like let us see so this is the audiogram on the top horizontal level it is in frequency it starts from lower level of 125 hertz and on the right side it increases up to 8000 hertz and on the left side vertical is the intensity of sound in decibel so it starts from 0 and it goes to the 80 decibel here it is minus 10 why because at 0 decibel it is not lack of sound 0 decibel is the minimum sound level required for the normal person to hear the sound so in some person which may have higher sense of hearing he can in even hear the minus decibel sound so it minus decibel means it is not lack of sound it is the level compared to the normal person so that is why it is in minus okay if you see x means it is for the left ear and circle means it is right ear so this is the audio profile of the normal person and this is the audio profile of the person having the hearing loss if you see there is a deepening of the curve at 4000 hertz that means the person is not able to hear sound only when the sound frequency is 4000 hertz otherwise it is having a normal profile so this kind of audio profiling is very important to provide the hearing aid Without this audio profile, you cannot provide a proper configurated hearing aid. If you give hearing aid as such, the person will have difficulty in hearing in spite of give, giving the hearing aid. So this audiogram is very important for providing the hearing aid. Okay, another imp uh, important test is BERA, that is Brainstem Evoked Response Audiometry. Typically, it is known as BERA test. Okay, now this test is again for demonstration purpose only, and it is an objective test. What is objective test? Objective test means the subject need not participate in this test. So we need not give any instruction to the subject. We have to just do the test, and we have to find out results by ourselves. That is why it is called objective test. These objective tests are very important to catch the malingerers. What are malingerers? Malingerers means the people who are imitating that they are having a disease, but they are not having the disease because of some sympathy or it is maybe because of some benefit that they may, they may be getting because they if they imitate that they have a disease there may be some benefit to them so these people are known as malingerers to catch the malingerers bera test is very effective so what we do we provide the headphone to the patient so headphone is being wearing on the head and we produce a sound okay the sound is been transmitted through the auditory pathway to the auditory cortex and in the auditory cortex we place the electrodes so electrodes are placed on the auditory cortex or the temporal cortex of the patient okay so the electrical signals of the auditory cortex have been taken up by the electrodes and the typical waveform is obtained from that so what is happening here is we are giving sound to the subject this sound is being transmitted through the auditory pathway into auditory cortex. So auditory cortex is stimulated and that stimulation is taken up by the electrodes and electrodes produce a waveform like this. So five waveforms are formed. Typically normal patient will have five waveforms and this is the time in millisecond. So this kind of waveform are produced in the BERA test. And if this waveform is formed, that means the person is not having deafness. The person is just imitating, is just faking it. That is the importance of BERA test. Another importance is to find out in which site the auditory pathway there is a lesion. Where the damage in the auditory pathway at which site there is a damage we can find out from the waveforms. So that is the, another importance of the BERA test.
okay lastly the general questions what are the questions that are asked in general first is what is the importance of air conduction and bone conduction as you already know the air conduction is normal thing and bone conduction is abnormal thing so based on this we can find out whether person is having normal hearing or not also we can find out which type of deafness the person is having so we can know whether the person is having conductive deafness or sensory neural deafness by knowing the air conduction and bone conduction status of the patient then why air conduction is better than bone conduction simply because nature is selected didn't it okay so let us go into scientific part why air conduction is better because in air conduction the sound is transmitted through the pinna to the ear canal into the eardrum where it is amplified by the ossicles and then it is transmitted to the cochlea so sound perception is very high compared in air conduction compared to the bone conduction bone conduction no amplification is done immediately the sound is transmitted from the skull bone to the cochlea also the tympanic reflex is present in air conduction but tympanic reflex is not present in bone conduction that is why air conduction is better than bone conduction and lastly what are the different types of deafness we already discussed in the topic of deafness there are three types of deafness one is conductive deafness second is sensory neural deafness and third is mixed deafness that means both conductive and sensory neural so these are the different types of deafness try to remember these answers of this question because this question can be even asked in university examination when this practical is asked in examination so that completes the general questions so let's summarize today's practical so what we learn today first the theory portion of the practical that is vestibular division and cochlear division of the vestibular cochlear now then the instruments which are used in the today's practical mainly the tuning fork then analog watch and galton whistle then how to use these instruments particularly how to use the tuning fork how to hold the tuning fork how to set up vibration of tuning fork so which are the correct method of using the tuning fork that we have discussed today and then which are the hearing test mainly the tuning fork test which are the tuning fork test three important tuning fork test one is the rainis test second is the weber's test and third is the squabex test then watch tick test and the voice test these are the only tests which you need to do in the university examination and lastly the questions uh, section of the question and answer from the journal so these are all things we have discussed in today's practical i hope you like today's practical video and please like share and subscribe this channel to see more videos So lastly, as at the end of all videos, we ask the medical question. That is a medical puzzle. So here also the medical question is: Tuning fork is placed on forehead. In bilateral deafness, I am dead. Lateralize towards me, or you will fail. I am the easiest test for diagnosis to sell. Tell me, die. Who am I? Please tell me the answer in the comment section below. I am eagerly waiting for your answer. I hope that you like today's practical video and stay tuned for all the practical videos in the future also. Bye bye for today. Hello students. Today I will share with you one important studying technique that is known as UVM technique. In this technique, you have to read the material three times. In first reading, you have to understand the material. In second reading, you have to visualize the material. That means look at the headings and how it is flowing. That is, which is the first heading, which is the second heading, which is the third heading, and so on and so forth. In the third reading, you have to memorize the material. That means you have to remember the details of each heading. And in that process, you have to give full attention while reading three times. If you are able to do this thing, I am quite confident that you will be able to remember the material for a very long time. I personally use this UEM technique to remember the study material. And using this same principle, if you watch this video three times, in first you understand the material, in second you visualize, and third you memorize. Then, if you watch this video three times, I am quite confident that the material that I am explaining in this video, you will be able to remember for quite a long time.